Welcome to Off the Coast, where we examine the views from Vancouver Island with your host, Rosemary Barnes. New and exciting things, preserved and respected things, business, recreation, politics, travel, all from the point of view of the people living and working on the island. Rosemary is a professional speaker and certified speaking coach living in historic Ladysmith and loving every day of the island life. Here is your Vancouver Island host, Rosemary. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Off the Coast, Views from Vancouver Island on Bold Radio Station. My name is Rosemary Barnes, the maverick voice at Confident Stages. Today, I am so pleased to welcome the mayor of Nanaimo, Vancouver Island's largest city, Mayor Bill McKay. Hello, Bill. Hello there, Rosemary. There's There's a lot of people that know that. Th- that, we're the largest I'm, city on Vancouver Island. That's true. So here I'm going to tell our listeners a little bit about you. And then w- there'll be a test later, just in case you don't know some of this stuff. You were born in 1955, so was I, by the way, and was raised in North Vancouver. You grew up on the mainland and spent summers vacationing on Protection Island, where your family home was built in 1970. Right so far? Yes. Wonderful. All right. As a child, Bill McKay attended the Pacific Marine Training Institute, where he obtained his first mate and captain's certificates. This led to his first role as a tugboat captain. And on Vancouver Island, that's a pretty responsible, important job. And you held that position for approximately 10 years. Then, in 1993, Mayor McKay, who wasn't the mayor yet, joined the Ministry of Transportation and served as captain on the Albion Ferry. Did I pronounce that right? Pretty close. Oh, what is it then? Well, we just, Albion. Albion. There you go. Yeah. All right. Following that, there was a promotion to the manager of operations and personnel, and in 2004... You accepted the same position at Nanaimo Harbor Link Corporation as the operators of the hyper hyperspeed passenger ferry Harbor Links. That's correct. Signage is a company in Nanaimo. Well, I, I'm sure it's elsewhere, but I use signage for all of my signs for uh, my company, Confident Stages, and what a fabulous, fabulous. So here's a shout out to Signage. If you have an opportunity to use that company to get your signs and advertising and whatnot, use them. They are fast, they are professional, they are efficient, and the quality is amazing. They are, in fact, a local leader in the display and visual services industry. Mayor McKay held that job, worked with them until July of 2014. He also acquired extensive and diverse board experience, serving as the director for Tourism Nanaimo, the Vancouver Island Raiders Football Club, the Sign Association of BC, and the Nanaimo City Centre Association. In 2011... He decided to pursue the political aspirations and was elected as a mayor of Nanaimo City Council. 2014, Mayor Bill McKay became Mayor Bill McKay. Currently, Mayor McKay is also a director of the Regional District of Nanaimo, a member of the Island Coastal Economic Trust, and the vice chair of the Island Corridor Foundation. So then my first question has to be, Mayor McKay, what do you do in your spare time? <laughs> <laughs> spare time, I call those my moments. Your and moments. My moments. And I, I have to tell you, I, uh, I love standing at the fence down at a Vancouver Island Raiders game or at an Imo Clippers hockey game. Um, I don't do enough gardening. Um, I uh, uh, I love spending time with family, though, and particularly going to see my sons in Vancouver. Mm. Do you still love the sea? I do, and but and I, you know I've got a completely different uh, outlook on ferry travel now. I consider it to be quite relaxing getting on a BC ferry, and I call it my uh, private yacht, where we uh, uh, back and forth across the across the sea. Which, see it's uh it's 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 what better what better than to have something like that to go home to 
It's it's true. Uh, and an hour and a half, hour and forty minutes of you can't you can't get off and have to be called into another meeting and that you have to be there in person. You are you are for that little hour free to do what you need to do. Certainly. No, I I, I just oh, I can't I can't tell you the number of times I just marvel coming across uh coming across the Gulf from uh from Vancouver and uh on a beautiful calm day and, and and just reveling and enjoying the sun and the wind in your hair it's just it's just great what a great feeling i was actually i i agree with you completely i was actually bringing my grandchildren over from the mainland they'd never been on a ferry before and in front of the ferry was a a school of porpoise oh, and yes. they were, and they were just having the time of the of their lives and of course now my girls, my grandchildren think that this is standard fare, and I have no problem telling them that it's if you're on the ferry, you're going to see some wonderful things if only you have time to look. So, at any rate, but you are uh, in the in the big spot for the for the for Nanaimo, and times don't time and tide doesn't wait for anyone. Everything is changing all the time. The future of of Nanaimo is one of huge growth, I suspect, from what I'm seeing. Um, And I noticed that that one of the things that we're kind of concerned about is the older neighborhoods, keeping up with the newer neighborhoods. Is this part of one of of the things that you're you're interested in pursuing at this point? Well, I... uh... You know, our, our, uh, as recently as four or five months ago, uh, our planning department was telling us that we should continue to expect something in the order of one and a half to two percent growth. And I truly believe, based on what I've seen happen over in the lower mainland, Maple Ridge, for example, has just gone through a huge explosion uh, of new of new uh, building over there because to to meet the demand. I suspect that we're right behind them, and we're starting to. Uh, see little bits and pieces of that right now the challenge is we made a conscious decision uh, in 2008 that this community was not going to grow outside of its boundaries that we were going to create uh, what we call an urban containment boundary within the city limits and we were going to develop only in those areas Hmm. the other thing we're seeing happening is that there's uh, there are a number of redevelopment projects we have uh, a lot of uh, very large lots in Nanaimo, you know, 12,000 uh, to 20,000 square foot lots where mm-hmm. there's, a, you know, probably a 3,000 square foot home on them. Uh, um, you know, a, a husband and wife would have raised their children there. Their children are all gone and perhaps one of the partners has passed on and now there's one person left living in that home. They certainly don't want to leave it until they, uh, they don't want to leave that home until they, until they pass. But we have to think about how we're going to redevelop those neighborhoods, considering the fact that the communities told us they want greater density and greater efficiency in Nanaimo. This is, this is going to be a tricky situation. It certainly is. And, and, and one of the things that I learned uh, from Richmond, uh, if we can use them as an example, they, you know, they, they talked about folks who bought homes in the, in the 60s and 70s that were on your standard 66 by 120 foot lot, you know, otherwise known as your Hudson Bay lot. Mm-hmm. And neighborhoods have been changing and the neighborhoods are now, uh, the, the buildings that are being placed on them are far more efficient and they're far more accommodating of density. So when your neighborhood starts to change, people start to fear that change. Always. So one of the things you have to do, <laughs> sir, one of the things you have to do, particularly when uh, you've got there's an appetite to do infill developments, tear down an old miner shack and build a three unit condo, for example, or a three unit row house. Uh, people fear that change, and they're cons- they have many concerns. However, when our community plan was developed, we uh, we had hundreds and hundreds of people in the community that got involved in that discussion, and they told us that they wanted to see greater efficiency, they wanted to see greater density, and we're trying to accommodate that. Certainly not to the level that you'll see in places like North Vancouver, uh, West Vancouver, and Vancouver proper, uh, nothing mm-hmm. like that. But 
a significantly greater density than what uh, we have now. Well, and of course, we also have the problem in that uh, a great number of people that live in Nanaimo are opposed to UP. Yes, yes. And what's interesting about UP, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to uh, going sideways, is yes. that you use up green space by going sideways. Uh-huh. That you can take a, p- a building and you can put it up and you can preserve green space or you can force the developer to integrate public spaces. One of the best examples that I can give you of that is at the foot of Lonsdale in North Vancouver. Where there's, a, where there's a hotel and a major residential development where the city recognized they needed public places. So they worked with the developer, gave the developer some density bonusing. They went up higher than what uh, the developer had originally asked for. And in return for public places and public spaces that that developer has now turned over to the community to use for many, many, many years. So there's advantages of up. And yet people are afraid of it because of course you don't they're they're worried about blocking the the exquisite views uh, and and you can see how NIMBY, not in my backyard, begins to raise NIMBY's little head uh, because yes, it would be wonderful to have. Uh, taller buildings so that we have all this uh, uh, higher density with smaller footprints. But, of course, the people just slightly inland of that would would be very upset. Let me tell you the tale of two cities, Saskatoon. Uh, Saskatoon thought they could see, they could look out in the horizon forever and they could just keep developing as much as their heart, you know, right to their heart content. And then they started to get some of the bills for maintaining Uh The, for maintaining the infrastructure, the roads, the sidewalks, the street lights, the sewers, the water connections. And they, they went into a state of shock. They said, my goodness, we can't continue on. This is not sustainable. We've got to start creating more density. Uh, if you look at Nanaimo, if you compare Nanaimo with Saanich, which is the largest municipality on Vancouver Island, their density is almost double what ours mm-hmm. is. You know, we're, we're at about nine, uh, eight to nine uh, people per per acre. They are at uh, they're at more like fifteen, sixteen. We're s- setting tar- targets in Nanaimo on new development at between ten and fifty in some neighborhoods. Hmm. There so is it comes it's, as a shock. It, here's, I'll, you know what else happens though, and I'm sure you thought about it. So I, I'm just trying to trying to ask your opinion. I was driving into Saanich yesterday afternoon, and it is dense there, and with good reason. It's prime real estate. It's fabulous to live there. Uh, you know, it, it's a wonderful place to live. But to get up Mackenzie, the main road in, uh, it was start and stop traffic at 3.30 in the afternoon because of the high density. So if we are going to increase the density in Nanaimo, and of course we have a similar problem in that Nanaimo is long, and and of course it's been built along the the ocean front. So how how are we going to handle the traffic changes that come with increased density? And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, and I'm not trying to do anything awful. I'm just asking how are we going to deal with that? Well, one of the things you have to do is you've got to concentrate some of your density, uh, particularly your, your, your larger density. When I say that, that we're doing more density, I'm talking about uh, going from nine people per hectare to upwards of 25. That's, those have been some of the more dense projects that we've seen, mm-hmm. but we're putting those up close to the university. Uh, we need to consider more density on bus routes because Nanaimo has, uh, has a challenge because it is so long and it, there is so much square, so many square miles to, uh, to concern yourself with delivering bus service. The more density you can put along those bus routes, uh, the better off you're going to be. And, and, and we have to stop thinking about the single occupant vehicle. I know that mm-hmm. your genera- our, our generation if I look at my driveway, there's three pe- there's three people live in the house and there's three cars. Of course, the X and, and the y motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, the three the X and Ys don't want to do that. Um, I myself am going to be trying out for the first time at the beginning of next month 
I'm going to get myself, uh, I'm, hopefully I've got one of the local bike shops that's going to sponsor it, if you will. But I'm going to get an electric bike, and I'm going to try driving or riding to work on a bike. We can do it along the E&N Trail. And I want to get the feel for that because I want to be able to do more where I can actually experience what the community experiences when they try to use bike lanes, some of our trails, uh, you know, determine what safety measures can be taken into a place, uh, put in place to improve them. We've got some roads. Uh, one of our main uh, uh, east-west thoroughfares is um, uh, Hammond Bay Road, and it's yes. it would be a nightmare to try to ride a bike to and from work along Hammond Bay Road. We've got to do better. Yes, yes. To alleviate it doesn't... the problem you talked about in Sandwich. Yes, and uh, to just simply draw a line uh, across an existing roadway or parallel to an existing roadway and call it a bike path doesn't work. <laughs> no, no, you know, I mean, that's, that's a stopgap. I, myself... We've got. Uh, my, I really believe, and I've, I've run up to some opposition, but I really believe that you can change communities significantly by putting in amenities that people want to use. We've got a couple of main thoroughfare, thoroughfares in Nanaimo that would be absolutely ideal for a what we what is known as a cycle track, mm-hmm. where you have you have a lane of traffic, you have a lane of parking, and that parking is separating uh, separating a pedestrian and the and the bicycle space uh, with a boulevard for example you make That's an brilliant inviting, well you make an inviting place for people to want to be able to walk we need in Nanaimo we've got a uh, we've got a goal to by 2040 to increase our trips of less than two kilometers by up to 24 percent of those trips to be done by foot by bicycle or by public transit and yeah. vancouver's goal in the same time frame is to get from 25 percent to 50 percent and they're creaming us victoria they're at 24 percent now yes so it, the reason why a lot of people will not go out on their bike or, or do it by pedestrian uh pathways or walkways or by transit is because we haven't provided those services well, and there's the thing is if you go out for a walk, the last thing that you want, to, even if you're walking to work, and especially if you're walking to work and you're in your dress clothes, you really don't want to be walking right next to the busy road with the dust and the noise and the congestion. So separating it uh, and, and allowing a beautiful walk along the way would always encourage people to do that. It's the same with the bicycles to be driving and all of, and have cars whizzing inches away from you. It, it makes you feared for your safety. The so num- the number one reason why people will not walk or use or use uh, or go by bicycle is because they don't feel safe. We need to do a better job of making them feel safe. I I think that's a brilliant idea. I I don't know why we haven't done this. Make this happen. <laughs> Well, so it's one of a million things that we're being asked to do right now. Oh, I'm sure. And everyone no, in, is in Indianapolis it created what they call the cultural trail. It was about eight miles long and it's uh, it's a full cycle track, cycle pedestrian track. And the, it cost them uh, 64 million dollars to do this eight mile stretch. However, they got uh, almost 100% of their funding from senior levels of government. It has transformed that city. It has transformed how people think. You go out there and you'll, you'll see hundreds upon hundreds of people using that trail every single day. It's absolutely amazing what, you'll, what people will gravitate towards if you give them what they want. And the other thing is, too, that, that think about the, the spin-off benefits of doing that, that simply by walking a half an hour a day, you lower your blood pressure, you lower your stress, thereby lowering the impact on our health care system. Yes. I mean, the Absolutely. spin-offs are, are brilliant. Uh, and then uh, with... Um, uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, bringing in food trucks and whatnot uh, and that sort of thing along these paths, wouldn't it be wonderful to have fruit stands? Certainly, certainly. Uh, what's interesting is that, is that a lot of people in the 
small uh, in, the, in the region, they love, uh, they love the public market. So I, I think it's probably time that we start having a conversation about creating one or two large public markets uh, mm-hmm. that operate on an ongoing basis, you know, seven days a week. Yes. Uh, and if we have to figure out how to get them, uh, uh, you know, get them access to space, uh, people want those sorts of things. Yes, the food they do. Trucks, the food trucks. I mean, my goodness, you don't need to go any further than North Vancouver to the uh, to the Friday night food truck festival. It's absolutely amazing. There are tens of thousands of people there. Uh, people are excited. There's smiles on their faces. You can. There's crafters. There's marketers. You can. You can buy. Uh, you can. You can buy. Uh, 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 you know, crepes, or you can buy Mexican, or you can buy a, a, a local wine, or a, a local craft brew, or get a chair massage, or buy a necklace. It's just amazing what they can do when you bring people places together. Well, and and for example, Granville Island is is hugely successful, uh, yeah. and and that's what that is. Is it's a marketing place for local local entrepreneurs and local produce and local this, that, the other, and the next thing. And correct me if I'm wrong, but does Nanaimo have anything that's a permanent structure like that at all? No, we don't. No, we have seasonal uh, seasonal markets only. That's a sacrilegious thing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> this shall not be. We must fix Particularly it. Particularly when so many people are so concerned about a about – a uh, hundred mile diet. You know, it's interesting. Yes. We've got one local brewery, the Long uh, the Longwood Brewery. They yes. actually have one product now that is one hundred percent grown and brewed locally. Everything from the hops to the yeast to the to the grains, everything is 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 uh, is, is is comes local from comes from a local provider. And it's interesting, you know, we all say that we want to uh, uh, eat local, support local, as long as it's convenient. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what's interesting is, is that there's that convenience thing. Um, much, much of the younger generation, it's going to be interesting to watch what happens with the eating habits over the next 25 years. Much of the X and Y gen, they, those folks are saying, no, we like food. Don't get us wrong. We like food, but we like to prepare our own food. And we like different food uh, than what our parents ate. And they're more selective about the type of foods they eat, uh, the type of cooking they do. And I think there's going to be a real renaissance. I think they're going to drive the demand for local, fresh produce and, and, and market vegetables and whatnot. As you may know, Mayor McKay, I am a public speaker, and when I speak in public, I speak on the changing leadership paradigms for the 21st century, So, and it's about understanding the generational differences. So X is doing this, Y is doing this, but oh my goodness, have a look at Generation Z. The mm. ones who are just barely on the, on the edge of entering the workforce. Talk about changing the way we live and the way we think and the and our social responsibility. This new generation is they are purpose driven and they are focused. And my goodness, if you think Generation Y is changing the way we eat and what we want and all those sorts of things, watch out for the next one coming up too. They and they too are very particular about what they do why they do it, with whom they do it, and how much they're going to pay for it. Now, it's interesting you say that because I actually live with a Z, and I am absolutely blown away at what, at how she thinks, um, mm-hmm. how she shops, uh, you know, uh, all of those different things, how she interacts with the world. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very, very different. And she's very, very frugal. Um, and, yes. and as you say, you know, she has a good friend who works uh, as a local barista. And every week her friend brings her laundry over and returns uh, the favor uh, by, by giving us a, a, a bag of coffee that she buys from her employer. Um, obviously at a staff discount, but, but, you know, they, there's all this interaction. It's really quite amazing to watch. And she's, uh, she's not, uh, she's pretty sharp how she shops. She doesn't get sucked oh, in. We they, do. and they have no brand loyalty whatsoever. 
If they no. want Lululemon, that's perfectly good, but only if it's on sale or the 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 lookalike is probably better quality anyway. We're going over there. <laughs> What's and interesting so, was yeah. What uh, she uh, uh, she went shopping recently. She was up at the Cabela's store, and yes. she saw a. Uh, she was there with our next door neighbor, who's a very good friend, and and she was looking for a sweatshirt, and so she was in the women's section, and they were. $140 sweatshirts on sale for $70. So she had one in her hand. It took her a long time to make the decision to buy. And then she, she took that over to, uh, to meet with, her, with, the, with the neighbor friend. And she said, I'm going to check the men's section and see what theirs look like. Well, she found out that they were regularly $69.95 and they were on sale for half price. So she tried the men's on and said, you know what? That sure doesn't feel any different than the, than the woman's for half the price. But it's just those sorts of, you know, thinking about uh, about how things actually work. She bought the men's. Absolutely she did. <laughs> uh, and and the brilliance of that is, so now we've got this generation come coming up who really know, they understand, because they've got the world at their fingertips. And so they have become expert at analyzing the information. And then coming to their own conclusions about it. So if we give them a beautiful path to walk and they compare the benefits of the walking and having a, a, an apple, a, a locally grown apple on the way versus spending insurance and gas and the purchase of a car, which do you think they're going to choose? Oh, absolutely! No, they're they're much smarter than we were, particularly they're much more thriftier, and they and they have to be because uh, you think about, uh, you know, if they're uh, if they're the the generation that's going to be saddled with significant debt uh, from for education, they uh, they're going to need to they're going to need to watch their pennies. Uh, that's what I find interesting about her is that she's taking her education in bite sized morsels rather than committing. Uh, because she might not want to, uh, might not want to do that. She's That's right. she's taken she's taken a year in one area. She's trying it out to see what it feels like, and she may, in fact, go back to school in September for something completely different. Well, and this is not the years of in the past where you chose one profession and generally stuck within that parameter for your life. Now, yes. it's a, it's so you have to have education in a thousand different areas. And here's the other thing is that these young people uh, are going to need places to live. Uh, uh, and they're looking for the same sorts of things as they are with their education, as they are with their uh, food budgets as they are with their clothing budgets they're looking for housing to suit this new lifestyle and so and housing i mean right now you know what's happening in the real estate market in nanaimo and in fact all over the island is that with housing being so expensive and unattainable on the mainland in so many cases guess who's going to come over here and Couldn't so Nanaimo, more. absolutely. And Victoria is already starting to get pretty pricey. So where's the next place to go? We're going to Nanaimo. So how are we? And in your position as mayor, have you have you started debating and thinking about how we're going to keep our housing affordable? I mean, when we get this influx of people, because we are. How are we oh, going to do that? There's, no, we're, we're absolutely getting them. Uh, right across the street from uh, right across the street from uh, from my house is a lot that was a double sized lot. Uh, it had a house sitting sideways on it, so it was sixty six by a hundred and uh, hundred sixty three twenty. Uh, it had a little garage in the back, and one elderly gentleman who lived there, Jack, until he passed away a couple of years ago. That lot's been now purchased. It's been cut in half, and it has. Uh, two small houses on it, each one of which has a suite in the basement. Uh, has it added some challenges to the to the neighborhood or to the immediate neighborhood with respect to parking? Yes, it has. But you know what? I have found those people. I have found the people that moved in there to be very, very respectful of the fact that they know that they were the new people moving in. They're uh, they're not encroaching on our space. Uh, I, 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 it's been a really interesting example. The other thing that we're seeing is more density. Uh, 
folks today don't, you know, they want a nice home, but they don't want to overbuy a home. They don't, don't feel that they need uh, six bedrooms and four bathrooms. Give us what we need in our current life situation, and they're happy with it. So we're seeing new and novel concepts that are coming out. We're seeing three to four unit row houses where the lot has now split into three separate lots. So they're fee simple. The only thing you share is a wall and a fence, uh, not unlike a normal, uh, almost unlike a normal home. We're seeing small homes, 12, 1300 square foot homes with two to three bedrooms in them uh, and a den and uh, almost like a glorified cabin, if you will like a summer cottage, but very, very nicely finished. Uh, and they're coming into the market for, the, these ones here are coming in the market at three hundred twenty-five dollars to $350,000, brand spanking new. Mm-hmm. That's and that's not, yeah, and that's not to say that Nanaimo still won't be able to offer the beautiful, huge mansions and whatnot that are up Hammond Bay Road uh, and the like of that. I mean, there's, there's incredible property, but... Uh, it, it, we still have to have something for this this new influx that are going to be coming in and at prices that they want to come in here for, right? Certainly. It, we need so, to have prices for every level of person uh, where they may be in their life, uh, whether it's an entry-level home, whether it's for someone who is a single-income earner, whether it's a senior, or whether it's a highly successful lawyer and his, and his partner, if you will, and his family. Um, his or her family. Those are very different markets, and we have to consider that every one of them needs to have product available. What about what about? And I'm curious about what the what the council and your your thoughts are on the highway coming in uh, on the parallels the old Victoria Highway. So coming in from the from the south along that corridor where where the, there's the, the hotel and the Econo and the Econo Motel and up in there, there's some really prime bits of real estate. And of course the homes are old and not very well tended and whatnot. And how can we possibly use that? Uh, and is there opportunity to use any of those properties um, to help solve this problem? We have, uh, uh, we're, we're in the middle of a conversation now in the early days. We call that the Terminal, terminal Nickel Street Corridor. That's it. It's, yeah, it's not, the, it's not the nicest and most inviting of areas. However, not to detract that there's many people in those neighborhoods that are both north and south of the of Nickel Street that uh, that tend to their homes and care, you know, are very house proud. So let's let's yes. make yes. sure that we recognize them. I yes. tell, tell people that if you are considering, if you have any money available, purchase a property down there. Consider redeveloping that property. That is Nanaimo's new frontier. The development that's going on in now that would be re um, that would be infill projects. The south end of Nanaimo, even south further south from that, uh, Cinnabar mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and the Harewood areas. Those ones there are also undergoing a complete uh, transformation, and it's it's healthy. You know, a lot of folks believe yes. that they're fearful. They're fearful of change, uh, and they're fearful of their neighborhood changing. But it's healthy because when you compare a community that's caught constant reinvestment and new money being put into it uh, to one that it's not, just take any one of the uh, take a look at any one of the prairie towns. Or, for example, uh, uh, my wife came from a pulp mill town in Ontario. And there's been no new investment in the community, and it's really sad to watch the denigration of the community and yes. the buildings and the streets and the sidewalks. And uh, as p- people move away and there's no new investment, uh, n- new investment is healthy uh, to, keep, uh, to keep neighborhoods alive. I agree with you. And and as you say, just off the main court, and you know, some of those pieces of real estate are just brilliant and the area could be 
so breathtaking. And there are people there who are so proud of of their lifetime accomplishments in their homes and whatnot. But there's just some some of the some of the properties there are just waiting. Just they're just prime for uh, and a reinvestment. And, no, I, and I uh, absolutely. That being said, of course, with this new un- influx of of people uh, and and higher densities, that is going to p- t- start the conversation going in the way of infrastructure to support it. So we're going to be needing, uh, and for all of Nanaimo, I mean, not everything is new. Uh, the, the, the water treatment plants and the wa- wastewater treatment plants and all the infrastructure that we're going to need to support this new influx of people and, in fact, replace what are probably starting to be fairly dated uh, systems. Uh, where, where are we with that? We, uh, five years ago, we started a program to add every year on a compounding basis an additional 1% to our, to our budget annually in order, to, uh, in order to go directly into asset management. The city of Nanaimo is pretty fortunate. We've got very, very low debt. Uh, one of the reasons for that, of course, is that many of the projects were built on a on a short term basis. Uh, our water treatment plant, for example, was uh, which we just opened in December, was a seventy two million dollar project, and over thirty six million of it came from senior levels of government. The balance was predominantly short term borrowing, and there's very very little uh, little debt on that, on that project. So the most of that project, 90% of that project will be, uh, will be paid off within another four years. The other one that we have to work on is, uh, that we're embarking on right now is a regional district project, but 99% of it will go directly to the city of Nanaimo. And that is our secondary treatment out on Hammond Bay road, which covers about, uh, about 60% of our population. That is, that project, there's another seventy million. There'll be some long-term debt on that one, uh, but it's something that we have to do. I mean, we just know we have to do that. It's uh, it's being demanded by senior levels of government, and in fact, it's being demanded by the public at large. Uh, look at the controversy down in in Victoria and, and all of the communities there. And, uh, Deplorable so, situation. Well, having such a struggle trying to trying to trying to get even figure out how to uh, to do something as elementary as secondary uh, treatment on their sewage. Unbelievable, isn't it? Yes, and, it is. Uh, and so you know, could, uh, yes, we have to have it. Period. Uh, no matter how you look at it, uh, put our environment and the people's consciousness of it. Uh, the the absolute honor of it, the integrity, we have to have uh, a sustainable, yes, but a, a very excellent secondary sewage treatment plant. We must have Certainly. it. Certainly. Now, one of the challenges that you have with the other, which is the underground services, your sewers and your water lines and mm. hydro and so on and so forth, is that there's nothing sexy about it. There's nope. no ribbons to cut when you dig up the road and put in, you know, two miles of new uh, new underground sur- sewers. Uh, what there is is every day. I mean, it's really interesting when you think about it. When you turn the tap on in your bathroom or in your kitchen sink, good, clean, fresh drinking water comes out of it. And then it goes down a drain once you've used it and it's disposed up through a completely separate system that has to be, has to be managed by the city and the public works groups and it, it's really quite a miracle when you think about it that that, that doesn't happen by magic no it, it doesn't very very expensive infrastructure and, and it's this, go ahead uh, it's it's the same as our roads there's yes. nothing sexy about about having to dig up a road because of base failure. Yes. And yes. having to try out a new a new asphalt because because this one wears better over time and is less slippery in the rain. There's nothing sexy about it and the bills are high. And so trying to get the public to understand that these are dollars that absolutely must be spent when they're when they're things that they take for granted is a very difficult road to hoe. 
That's correct. And you have to also consider to what standard are you maintaining your roads to. Oh, uh, we, yes. we have a fairly high standard in Nanaimo, um, and some people begrudge it. And it's very, very easy for a politician to be able to say, if I, I just stretch the remediation out on that road another year, then this is what I can save to do toward uh, to use towards something else, and it's foolhardy at, at best. My husband is a civil engineer uh, and worked for the city of Edmonton for uh, most of his life, and so roadway construction is and maintenance and that sort of thing is very near and dear to my heart. So I say kudos to you for understanding that you cannot, you cannot let your roadways start going to pothole. <laughs> you must, yeah. you absolutely must make sure that your roads are passable and safe. Yes. And if you start letting them go, then to fix them becomes just an escalating price tag that, that you can't control. It goes it goes right out, and the longer you wait, the more it has to be fixed and the worse the situation gets, and the more upheaval you have to cause to the citizens. Correct. But worse than that, and people don't understand that because all they can see is that it's a disruption to their traffic flow. <laughs> and, and it's expensive, and and they don't understand the costs of that. But even a harder one is your underground systems. Yes. We don't get it. No, How often no. does the person who flushes the toilet think about all the brilliance that has to go in to make that work? Oh, and absolutely. It, and it comes with a big price tag. Now, the other thing, of course, that our people work very very hard on. We will, in, in some cases, we'll actually replace uh, replace uh, certain pipes, for example, water pipes, let's say, or sewer pipes, uh, you know, uh, maybe 10 years before the end of life in some cases. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we're doing that is because you've got to go, and everybody just, it drives you crazy when you see the road being dug up. And all new sewer pipes are put in. And then five years later, the road gets dug up all over again to put new water pipes in. Yep. Or new other, you know, we've got other new services. And, and so what our people are very mindful of, if we've got something where it's approaching, where we have to, we have to go in and replace a sewer and the, uh, the, the other services in there are approaching end of life, even though they're not there yet, they replace them at the same time. Nothing drives me crazier than to see a beautiful piece of road that has been reconstructed and it's brilliant and it's fantastic and it's got the right crown on it and the drainage is brilliant. And two weeks later, sewers come in and dig it up because they have to replace the sewerage now. Exactly. Exactly. I can't our, think our of people are, no, Our people are very mindful of that and I, and I have to give them a lot of credit. One of the Things we're doing in Nanaimo is every time we touch a road now, if we're doing it because we're replacing services, then we uh, we also reconfigure the road if there's any possible way to do so to enhance uh, walkability and bike lanes, and and or just simple things like uh, like like markings, if you will. We're playing with two or three different styles here, uh, really? trying to get the community used to it. Uh, so, for example. Uh, having bike lanes outside of the parking lanes, and now we've gone to some where we've actually got parking outside the bike lanes. So the so the cars park out, you know, four or five feet from the curb, and the bicycles go inside, and they're protected from the traffic. That sounds really clever, but doesn't that cause need for wider right of ways? Right. That, doesn't that that needs more property? Not necessarily. No, not necessarily. Uh, you know, what's also interesting is, is that we also have to remember that the first, when you start talking about bike lanes and, and pedestrian pathways, the, the first thing that people are concerned about is the reduction of, of vehicle lanes. And New York City has all kinds of evidence that says that when they took vehicle lanes out and replaced them with bicycles and bus and, and, and pedestrian paths, that in fact, if you can 
compare the length of time, travel time from street, you know, street number one to street number 40, if you will, before these lanes were changed and these new services were provided, you're actually doing it faster today than you were back then. It's really quite a phenomenon. Isn't that something? Yep. When they started doing a number of these changes in New York, uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg was the mayor at the time, and he was a real stickler for um, he was a real stickler for show me the proof. He, he was all about stats, so he yeah. made his people very, very carefully record, uh, you know, befores and afters, and said if this doesn't work and our figures don't show that it works, then we're going to get rid of it. And they've been right every time. Wow. Yes. It's it's um, curious, isn't it? Look at the Broad Street Bridge. Um, now, I don't know what the numbers are today, but I'd be willing to bet you that I could, if I could predict them. Uh, look at all the furor in the Broad Street Bridge with taking lanes out and putting them for bicycles and pedestrians, making them more bicycle and pedestrian friendly. friendly. Um, I would be willing to bet you, based on what I was told last year, that they're probably up to a quarter of a million people a month use those with their bicycles. That's a lot in of United, bicycles. Yes. In, in the United States right now, for every car that's being sold, there are three bicycles being sold. There is a renaissance of the bicycle. That's And fortunately, with our climate here, we can do that. Now, try that in Edmonton. <laughs> True we're, enough. We're, now, Indianapolis has got the same thing, but you know, it's, it's interesting. They People want to get outside in the fresh air, give them good, safe pathways. If there's snow on the ground, make sure that they're, that they're, they're shoveled off and, and cleared quickly, and people will use them. It's, and, and with any luck, we'll be able to turn around the obesity epidemic and all those kinds of things at the same time, right? Sure. And Certainly. again, the spirit. The spinoff then on on the draw on our health care, on the draw on so many of the other things might be might be benefits that we're not really considering at the moment, right? Uh-huh. So then I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, because as I was just mentioning, and what a lovely segue I just created, that we were talking about the environmental concerns and and here in in on Vancouver Island, of course, we can ride bicycles year round. There, it's very, very few days that that we have concern over over the weather and the slippery, and the, we certainly don't need chains on bicycle wheels like occasionally I've saw in Edmonton. But that turns us to yes, we live in this paradise, and that is cause for concern about environmental initiatives. It is. Uh, now, some of the challenges that we've got here is that is that people want to ensure that their their children have places to to work, industries to work in. Uh, sometimes those industries come with a smokestack. Yeah, we have to we have to understand that everything we do has an effect has an effect on the environment. Uh, whether it's, uh, you know, whether we, we, we've got a smokestack industry or even something as minor as biomass burning, if you will, uh, to create electricity. Uh, we have to understand that everything we do, including how do we get rid of our garbage? How do we, you know, how do we deal with, uh, with land clearing in, in areas that are being developed? Uh, you know, what are we going to do about, uh, about, refuse like uh, for example mattresses and chesterfields and all of those things that fill up your uh, your landfills very very quickly but by the same yeah. token we also spend way too much time thinking about our facilities and not how did we get to those facilities yeah. for example university they are very proud of their record on their facilities and and the conversion to all kinds of energy saving equipment and light bulbs and so on and so forth. But we need to take a look out the window and look at those 1,700 uh, single occupant vehicles that are sitting out in the parking lot. That's a big consequence in our community. We've got to work harder at that. And what about, uh, I don't, could you tell me what the, what the bylaw is on burning refuse in Nanaimo? 
we there, there's no burning allowed in Nanaimo. There are, there are in, days, there, there in, are certain in, days in, in the fall that burning is allowed, but generally and by and large, it's not permitted at all unless it's a cooking fire. Uh, and uh, well, yes, uh, I in areas surrounding Nanaimo, there there seems to be quite a lot of burning. Yes, there is. And areas surrounding the Nanaimo, one of the one of the one of the biggest challenges that Environment Canada has, or pardon me, uh, the BC Environment Ministry has, is the uh, is at certain times of the year we have air inversions, and they're yes. generally times of winter, and the air quality uh, goes down significantly, predominantly by wood stove operation. Yes, um, Mayor what, McKay, I'm hearing another voice in the background. Uh, and I'm concerned that our listeners may may find it difficult to concentrate on your hearing. Is there a radio or anything on? It's actually my assistant in her outer office. I just closed the door. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> now we can now we can give you the complete attention you deserve. And so the, yes, the inversion layers, and because there are so many homes being heated by wood burning, uh, what are we what? What's the status on that? What what in Nanaimo proper? There's probably not so much of that, right? No, there's not. I mean, uh, the folks that live outside the boundaries of the community tend to be a little bit more of the frontier style, if you will. Um, they want to be able to use a wood burning stove. Uh, they uh, they don't worry about uh, about uh, organic composting because they do it in their yards or in their you know out in their fields. Uh, when you get into the urban areas, people are more concerned because of the density in the in the community. They're more concerned about wood stoves and uh, and water usage and organics recycling and so on and so forth. So you see very very different habits. But it's challenging when, uh, for example, with the wood stoves, uh, we see many areas where people want a want a country style or country lifestyle. But they, in some nights and some days, when you get into these inversions, they've got uh, very, very poor air quality. Now, somebody wants to upgrade their wood stove to something far more efficient and better for the environment. Uh, you have to really force them to go to a new, more efficient unit, but they have to destroy their old one. Because there's always a neighbor that wants to get their old one and put it out in their workshop or some such thing like that. So you've gained nothing. Uh, yes. Our local recycling facility, they get beautiful wood stoves in all the time. Uh, and there, there's such a temptation to resell them because they can, they can earn revenue for it. However, yes. they, they destroy them because they know it's the right thing to do. There's... I have a question for you, and I'm sure you'll be able to at least point me in the right direction. Glass is not being recycled. You know, we don't put we don't put glass jars into our recycle bins. Correct. I don't understand. <laughs> right now, right now, there's very little market for glass. So what ends up happening is that it gets crushed up. It can be crushed up and used for uh, uh, used for roadbed. Uh, the challenge with glass is there's very very little of it out there right now. We would like to. Um, we've been so much concentrating on sort of the low hanging fruit in the recycling business. Yeah. I would like to see an opportunity, for example, for our local social enterprise, the Nanaimo Recycling exchange to be given an opportunity even if we have to backstop a loan for them if they could find a market for ground glass like they have in the niagara recycling facility they crush it into three different grades of, of what ends up being used as sandblasting grit yes and, and i would love to be able to see those folks uh be given the opportunity for a new revenue stream so they can continue to provide more services in the in the recycling uh, business, uh, and we've got shipyards and industrial facilities not far from here. Uh, but it's just a matter of somebody championing that project, and we could, in fact, I would like Nanaimo to be uh, the headquarters for paper, glass, and plastics recycling. 
including a, a pot potential for a polymer plant out at uh, our big industrial park called Duke Point. And, um, I mean, think of the benefits of this. Still less in the landfills, uh, which is, of course, a huge problem. We are an island and we do not have infinite acreage. And uh, so less of our, our, our space being used for landfills, more employment, more profit, more all kinds of things. I'm, I'm very confused about why this hasn't already been done. Uh, a lot of the markets have, uh, you have to create your own market for the product uh, uh. in that business. So it used to be the number one item in the, uh, in the, in the recycling bin was newsprint. Yes. And now newsprint's down by probably 80 to 90% of what it was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the markets have dropped out of, uh, uh, dropped out of cardboard and uh, plastics have been up until recently been very, very difficult to try to, uh, to try to uh, recycle. And so uh, you need to, in some cases, create markets. We're looking right now, uh, what do you do with a mattress? We yes. were, I went, I went on a tour. I mean, they fill up your landfill uh, like you wouldn't believe. The volume of space they take up is amazing. However, uh, there is, uh, there's companies in Vancouver that have got into the recycling business. They charge about $11 a, a mattress to recycle. That's not unreasonable. And they found a market for almost every piece of that mattress. That's what it's about. It's about free enterprise, getting folks to go out there and discover new markets for the reclaimed products, getting a decent value for them. If they're not getting a value for them, uh, well, then, then, then you help them uh, by perhaps even considering subsidizing them. And I'll give you an example. We provide to our Nanaimo Recycling Exchange about, uh, about um, well, we, we provide them with a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in funding. With that, they divert, they divert about uh, 15,000 tons of waste from the landfill. They do it for about $26 a ton. Conversely, our landfill costs us about $96 a ton. So you tell me where the better investment is. Yeah, it's not absolutely. hard to figure out. It's a no-brainer. Absolutely. So, Mayor McKay, we have run out of time. The hour has fun. flown by. <laughs> and I thank you so much for being my guest on today's show. Stay on the line after, after we sign off, Mayor McKay, and I'll, I'll chat with you just a little bit more. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me next week when my guest will be Jivan Chima. She is an amazing woman. Watch on my feed. I will give you all the, all the information you're going to want to know. Please join me again next week for another issue of Off the Coast Views from Vancouver Island. This is Rosemary Barnes, the Maverick Voice at Confidence Stages, saying have a wonderful week. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to Off the Coast, Views from Vancouver Island, with host Rosemary Barnes. To book Rosemary as a speaker or speaking coach, or to offer suggestions of extraordinary guests for the show, please visit her website at www.confidencestages.com.